in my office. Here's my office here. Here we are. Come on in, won't you? From the offices of a new game studio. And this is our test department. Very exciting. Hello, testers. You know, everybody wants to start their own company eventually. An industry legend. Uh, this is the exciting manner in which I work at my desk. Tim certainly does not follow the herd. He goes his own way for good or ill. That's something I admire. And his team of talented game developers. I'm an environment artist. I'm the animation supervisor. I'm an animator. And I'm the lead game tester. I am the orderly. And I run a quiet, peaceful, insane asylum. We'll race the clock to ship their very first game. We played Bruce here because we were always battling against time. We've been working on the game for three and a half years. This is one of the worst crunches I've ever seen. Sort of appalling. We decided at the very last minute to actually test it. <laughs> this is the story of Tim Schafer and the final week of Psychonauts. What could possibly go wrong? Come on in, come on in. Welcome Double Fine. Please, everyone is welcome at Double Fine. We've been here about uh, a year and a half. We moved over one block nicer, one block fancier. Here's our production area. Hello, everybody. Say hi. That's Kelly and Melina. That's Carolyn, hi. my executive producer. Hey, hello. I'm executive producer. I'm kind of the acting production person. I do just about everything um, the company needs to allow Tim to be 100% creative as much as possible. Here's our art department. It's Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello. Playing the game, excellent game, Psychonauts, right now. Scott Campbell, our art director. This is a camera. I draw stuff and show Tim, and it's like a long process of like him liking it or not liking it or kind of liking it. What are you making of? So who's that character? Okay, so anyway. Your gameplay programming department. Hello, gameplay programmers. So, hello. This week, Tim Schaefer and his team of game developers are putting finishing touches on their first game, Psychonauts. We've been working on the game for three and a half years. A lot of the animation's been done for quite a while. This is our last week of working on Psychonauts. I think this week is the, this Friday night is the last the last build. We just have to have it done. CD. So this is the final build. So this week is the last bit of time we have to touch it. Game developers call this. Crunch mode is in the very, very last phases of the game, and it's basically you just want to put as many hours into the game and to test it. We've done everything creatively we're going to do to the game. Those are good. Yeah, that's too, too low. low, too low. Oh yeah. my god, that's terrible. Man, you can't ship with that. They would return low. the game if they saw that. And now we just have to play it for a certain amount of time and make sure no new bugs come up. So it can't crash, it can't slow down, nothing really bad can happen. Lies. We can't write any more dialogue or add any more ideas to it, but we can definitely make sure it's not going to crash right away. We are going to be testing at least probably 12 hours a day, trying to find any last showstoppers, any bugs that we can't ship. And you can't punch at all? The goal is to have everyone playing through the game. There's a team of over 40 people. All of us and all of Majesco's resources are getting through the entire game, so making sure the game is, is ready to go out. What happens if it's not done by Friday? Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> We're screwed. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? No. I can't punch. Tim Schafer's first taste of gaming happens when the Magnavox Odyssey is released in 1972. Way back when I was a kid, my dad brought home uh, Odyssey 1, which was uh, the black and white variations of Pong. He quickly becomes one of the world's first hardcore gamers. Ever since then, I was, I was hooked on games, and then we got our Atari 2600. Yeah, and went from there to Atari computers, and I got a 400, and an 800, and then I just spent 
all my teenage years at home toiling over that computer in the uh, rec room of our house, scaring my whole family. And like many gamers of his time, Tim Schafer begins creating his own games. I started as best I could to actually make them myself when I had the computer, although my efforts were really unspectacular. In basic, I tried to do a Pong in basic, and it was really slow. So I tried to do Galaxian in assembly language. Then I just realized how I, I wasn't really smart enough to do that. So I had this one game about a, a helicopter that was dropping babies, and you had to catch them. I got pretty far with that one. But when he attends college at UC Berkeley, Schaefer tries to be more realistic about his future. I never really thought that games were what I was going to end up doing. <laughs> So as I went to college, I, I did more computer classes and I started to drift into writing. I was going to be a writer who had a really boring computer programming database job during the day and then write at night. He really is a really smart guy, a really funny guy, satirical. Off the top of my head, the first funny game I remember was Leisure Suit Larry or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I guess Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy came out first. You can really tell that he has an opinion on everything. I'm trying to think if there's anything else funny in games ever. And he's not afraid to, to tell you about it. I think it was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. No, that, that can't be right. Sometimes in a, in a world where everybody seems to kind of be a, afraid to say what they think or do what they think or follow the herd. Help me out. Anything funny before Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Tim certainly does not follow the herd. He goes his own way. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say the first humor in games I remember was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And that, that's something that I admire. But it turns out that fate has a different plan for Tim Schaefer. I graduated and I was on my second interview with this database company. And right then I saw this job listing at LucasArts, which was then called Lucasfilm Games. It was even more kind of glamorous and appealing. And I loved the first Lucasfilm games, like Rescue and Fractalus and Ball Blazer. But a friend of mine had slipped me a pirated copy of it, so I called it Ball Blaster during my interview. I was like, yeah, I really like your game Ball Blaster. And they're like, Ball Blaster, huh? That's, that's what it was called when it was pirated. So was, I, I don't know how I got that job, but somehow I got that job. Now, with his foot in the door, Schaefer will take his first step into gaming history. As Tim Schaefer takes his first baby steps in the gaming industry, he finds he has some catching up to do. The job description that I applied for was called uh, uh, assistant designer slash programmer. And then I found out once we got there that they were actually called scumlets, which, which was the lowest rung on the uh, programming totem pole there. That we were just the uh, junior programmers who used scum, which was the script creation utility for Maniac Mansion. The rookie game developer quickly starts making new friends. They had nothing for us to do for like three months. It was all up to just whatever we'd come up with each day to try to learn the language. And Dave Grossman and I came up with a lot of joke stuff. Which then leads to his first project. It turns out Ron Gilbert was a starting in a Monkey Island game. And he was like, okay, I want it to be kind of maybe a comedy game. So they took me and Dave and set us to work on it. Tim was one of those guys who was just a, a hard-working scripter for the scum games. But he was just this 
really fun guy who could tell great stories, and he was just quick-witted, you know, he'd, he'd say anything, he's got a comeback for you. He was one of those people that you could tell was going to just drive, you know, some amazing creative visions. We started working on the Monkey Island game, and Ron had the design in his head, and there were some flow charts, and there was some background art. We started just to get the thing up and running, uh, throwing in characters and just making them say dumb things that we thought was funny. And we are all four of the original scumbots in this room, and we would just write dialogue that would crack us up. <laughs> Tim Schafer is hilarious in real life. All his observations, his whole way of viewing the world is just kind of like a little twisted. Just definitely funny. You know, every afternoon, Ron would come in, maybe, and we'd, he'd check out the new dialogue we'd written. And we didn't think it was actual game dialogue. We just thought we were writing stuff to entertain each other. And it turns out, he's like, no, we're, we're using this. This is it. This is the game. Ron would come in in the afternoon. He'd either laugh or not, and that was, like, a big deal. Huh? And he was really involved in the games. And me, I, I would do a third of it, Dave would do a third of it, and Ron would do a third of it on the first game, programming and writing dialogue. Tim Schaefer and his co-workers come up with a storyline about a wannabe swashbuckler named Guybrush Threepwood and his quest to become a mighty pirate. Your favorite moments in the Monkey Island games were largely a result of Tim's hard work and cleverness. It was really uh, inspiring to be working with someone having just as much fun. In 1990, development on The Secret of Monkey Island wraps up, and Lucasfilm Games releases the quirky new adventure game for the PC, but its launch hits a small snag. Lucas Arts was a small company then, and right at the end of it, they found out there was a big order that they could fill, but they didn't have the manufacturing capacity to do it. It's like, hey, let's all go down to the factory and, and pack it ourselves. And we all put everyone in the car, and we drove down to this warehouse, and we all went in there, and we were all putting manuals together, and, and we were all just stuffing boxes and shrink wrapping them. So the original Monkey Island shipment was done by the programmers and the artists and all of us in the company. With love, man. As copies of The Secret of Monkey Island head out to stores all over America, Tim Schafer and his co-workers leave the fate of their careers in the hands of gamers. chicken curry, three orders of natron mushroom, six orders of sog paneer, seven orders of chicken tikka masala. Yeah, and can we get it made extra spicy? And then I'd like to get um, 25 orders of naan, three orders of samosa, and two cucumber salads. Um, Kelly? Yeah. Hello? Where'd you go? Oh man, I just got disconnected. <laughs> you said earlier that you guys were gonna wait to have dinner until all the buns were mixed. Yeah, but then we'd starve the team. I kind of cheated. I added some bugs to the, <laughs> to the lockdown list. This is doable tonight. So I think we'll finish this before we go home tonight. Late. <laughs> Late. Probably go after midnight. Was pretty important and we'll do whatever we need we will cater in food and we'll bring in massage therapists and we'll liquor them up <laughs> and bring in sugar that makes people happy oh you're so not gonna win against the girl <laughs> during crunch time it's common for developers to work 12-hour shifts at double fine it's no different the game itself motivates the team. They're motivated first and foremost by pride in their work. Tim motivates people as well. When he sees something cool and unique and tells them. Nice, okay, 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 that's one bug. That makes people happy. Well, it's 8.44, yep, leaving for the night. 
I feel a little bit bad because the other programmers are still there and they're still working. If you've already put in a 12 hour day, then you have to take care of your body. There's a lot of sick people here and <laughs> it's not surprising. Am I tired? Kind of. We've been crunching for, for quite a while. It helps to know that this is our last week. I work about 80 hours a week, or I have been. This is like the most unglamorous part of my job. And it's not necessarily a requirement. There's just so, so much miscellaneous sh just <laughs> Sorry. Don't worry about it. So much stuff that I, they just throw at me to do. We gotta keep the team caffeinated so they'll stay up all night. Check it out. Uh, I'm a caffeine addict, so they'll pick the habit once the game's over, I guess. The 1990 release of Monkey Island is a huge success for Lucasfilm Games. One of the hardest things to do in a game is get humor across, because as the game creator, you can't control the pace of the game, and so much humor depends on pacing. And so the fact that the Monkey Island series is just hilarious, like it's just a testament to the skill of the designers. And just like in Hollywood, a sequel starts right away. After Monkey Island 1, we started making uh, LeChuck's Revenge right away. Monkey Island 2, LeChuck's Revenge, is an even bigger hit than the original. Its success gives Schaefer and Dave Grossman a chance to finally head up their own game. They told Dave and I that we could do our own game. Ron had kind of an idea for a sequel to Maniac Mansion. But now, I know that I must go back to the mansion. We started with that and just kind of ran with it. The name of this new adventure game is... Get a Tentacle was the first game I was a project leader on, so we were in charge of the show for the first time, Dave and I. We brought up the design and got some programmers to help us with it, and we had a team of just like three animators. Tim Schafer and his team craft another hilarious storyline, this time involving a gang of misfits who travel through time in specially modified porta potties known as... The Chronogen! Dave and I just kind of ran with it. After we took the characters we liked and then put in the heavy metal band roadie. Bernard, float over here so I can punch you. I'm the crazed med student. What have you done this time, you meddling milk toast? That game to me was like things that I loved about you know, LucasArts back in the day. Those games were fun. Uh, uh, uh. Those games had attitude. Look, Hoagie, it's a hamster. Just what I need for dissection lab tomorrow. I think I need that for the band, Laverne. We could bite its head off or whatever. Something different in the crowd back then. It was a lot of fun. Day of the Tentacle was one of the most fun ones to make. Day of the Tentacle has PC gamers in stitches when it's released in 1993. But by now, adventure games are facing a serious decline. LucasArts decides that something must be done to save the genre. Schedule has been a really hard one to keep, and again, it's a very, very big game. The levels, at least, have been entirely built, and it's clear. I mean, anyone can look on our task list and see that what remains to be done are little polished devil in the detail bugs. Twenty-three. There's twenty-three bugs in there. That's not so bad. Hmm. Maybe I'm not doing it right. That's a great question. Hey, um. It's a bug where if you jump in the air and you palm bomb and then you cancel. Yeah. You don't punch when you're on the ground? Right. You need to be on the levitation ball. Oh! Oh, okay. I think I know what you're doing. died at that yeah and it took me back I mean, you know the six men the fact that you know that the, the bugs are pretty minor for the most part means that we're we're almost done yeah that's that's good news okay so you lost all your lives mm -hmm. on the way there you suck <laughs>
yeah, at this stage, like, the worst things are, you know, people getting stuck here in some place that's really hard to get to. I can go back to the adventure where I've saved it. Uh, you should do that, yes. Or we have this sound stuttering. Do you hear it, Pop? Agent 9? I'm here for the advanced training. So we really want to try and catch that stuff. Out of here. There's no turning back. Julie. You fought the demon and killed the demon. No, I fought the demon and died. Killed the bad bug. Okay. Yeah, well, what I was thinking is we could we could write us back and let you fix it for it. But I hate to change it because all the boss fights can break. We would want to check it with all of those. Yeah. We try not to fix bugs unless they're really, really important because every time you fix a bug, you enter the possibility of causing another bug. So we try not to destabilize code like that. Now that you pointed it out, now I know <laughs> they're really important. We fix them and then we check just that area a lot. We can leave it on the list, write a fix for it, and then see if it's worth it. Dialogue is very important to me, so I don't. I want to get that one right. Yeah. Well, now I leave it to you to <laughs> okay. decide. Okay. Let's see, what causes the bugs? Bugs are caused by small electric gremlins that live in the wiring of old buildings. And there's no one who can stop them except for you and me. Oh my god, let's make out! That's why we got this modern building here. There's a glitch, and it's a pretty big glitch. The year is 1993, and the popularity of adventure games is fading. We may not live to see yesterday. This is all your fault, Bernard. He did think actually did better than the Monkey Island games, but they they wanted more, and they were just trying to keep adventure games alive in a way because you can see the market growing and adventure games kind of staying the same size. So Lucas Arts calls their developers to revitalize the ailing genre. They really encouraged us to try new things with the adventure games, and that's where Full Throttle came from. The theory I had at the beginning of that was, you know, our characters so far have been funny, but the joke is mostly on them. It's like characters who are the butt of all the jokes, and you're kind of laughing at yourself when you play it, kind of. And I thought maybe people who are playing adventure games would want to be a character who's actually not a goofball, but cooler than them, and bigger than them, and tougher than them. You could ride a big, huge motorcycle and lead this gang of bikers. Now there goes some boys I can ride with. The idea of making a character who was heroic. Yeah, and you're in my way. Come on, kitty! Let's get down! Big and cool and tough, and it's something you'd aspire to be. But also stripping down the interface, which is something I was really into. Like, I didn't see any reason why you had to click, you know, up and down on the screen and do these verbs and drag them onto, you know, why not just have this cool little tattoo that pops up wherever you are. Not as many inventory items. I'm not putting my lips on that. Just make it a much more streamlined interface and game playing experience. <laughs> With full throttle, Schaefer forges ahead into new territory. The story of full throttle is a little more dark and some violence happens in it. There's betrayal and all these darker elements to it. It's almost like a little noir story. You know what might look better on your nose? What? The bar. I think it was right. That kind of paid off in that game. Someone did say something about killing you and making it look like an accident. They didn't do too good of a job there. It was the biggest hit we had at that point with the adventure games. It was a huge hit. And I was really happy with that. After shipping full throttle, Schaefer is tempted to venture into new territory himself. But the idea doesn't last long. For a while after throttle, I was really into Warcraft. And I was going to do a Warcraft game, I remember. I was like... Gonna, I had this idea for one that I wanted to do, and then after working on that for a while, I realized, like, wait, what am I talking about? I, I make uh, adventure games. No! Schaefer's next game will be his final project with LucasArts, and he's going to go out with a bang. You'll be happy to know we're fixing that bug. As Psychonauts gets closer to completion, the pressure to get the game out the door mounts, but the team believes in their product. And to them, every hard hour is worth it. This is some of uh, the concept art of Scott. It's 
Got Campo, who drew this. I did all the characters. Here's drawings of all the camp kids in camp. Here's an early drawing of Raz. So here's some other Razzes right here. This is what he used to look like. He was this kid with a stocking cap. And we modeled him and put him in the game. He's like kind of baggy pants and baggy jacket and stuff like that. And like he was totally not very limber. And everyone thought he was a girl too. Because they thought his long stocking cap was a ponytail. It just didn't test well. We had to go back and redesign it. It sounded terrible when we first heard about it, because we're like, you want to remodel the main character of the game after we've done all this animation for it. But it's definitely the best thing to do. This right here is Raz's love interest. Lily is her name. She's cute. She's wearing like a little plaid sweater. And she's got a little hand stockings, kind of like those kids love in Japan. And she's one of the girls at camp. She doesn't really care about stuff. Hey, Brainiacs, settle down. Why? You worried I'm gonna hurt your boyfriend? No. She's kind of over it, but she's really amazing psychic. Duh. My name is Stephen Peck, and I'm the lead game tester of Psychonauts. Just because Psychonauts become a huge part of my life, I decided to get a couple of the characters tattooed on my leg. No! And it's super exciting for me because I've never seen something uh, drawn on somebody's body before. Ah! Oh my gosh. Oh, that is so great. No pardon, no pardon. I kind of specialize in a lot of the camera, camera controlling. A lot of times we kind of have to adjust the camera to fit the moment. What? For instance, if you're in a boss fight with a big boss monster. The full destructive force of an angry critic! <laughs> you kind of want a lower camera to make him look bigger. Your fighting is weak, uninspired, and flat as a pet. Make a tighter FOV to make him look more menacing. Enough horseplay, Rasputin. Destroy him! Ah, oh, they got that in. Nice. Wow. Now that we're near the end, we're... We're running short on sleep, but we're almost there. We're all really excited to have it almost done. Despite Full Throttle's success, adventure games continue to decline. Once again, Tim Schafer and his team at LucasArts band together in another bid to turn the tide. To guarantee that this new game will be truly unique, Schaefer looks south of the border. I, I was often really inspired by art, and I had this book of Day of the Dead paper mache sculpture, and I just love the characters in it because they're these little paper mache skeletons, and they had little paper mache houses or cardboard houses that they lived in. I just love the idea of seeing a whole town of these people jumping and running around and coming to life. LucasArts also wants this new game to take advantage of the latest advances in PC technology. We'd always done 2D games, and 3D was a new hot thing. And everybody, you know, you were lame if you're still doing 2D. But I didn't like the way it looked. I, I, it always looked like the characters were these cardboard boxes that had been duct taped together. When I looked at these calaveras, these little paper mache skeletons, that's like exactly what the texture map technology is we have these days. This is where there's an intersection of technology and art, where it's an art style, not a limitation. After putting two and two together, Tim Schafer comes up with Grim Fandango. The story for Grim Fandango was inspired a lot by a Big Sleep. Also movies like Playing Gary Glenn Ross. I am ready to take you now. Take me? Take me where? It was this film noir story. You need to be nervous. Nervous? Just your appearance. It's a little intimidating. Intimidating? Me? There were sad parts in Grim Fandango that were probably more emotional than most games. Because, again, it's about a character you care about. They don't qualify for anything good, so I can't sell anything good. I can't work off my time, and I'm stuck. Stuck selling walking sticks to a bunch of burros for eternity. Tim will end up working on Grim Fandango longer than any other game he's done before. Uh, it's funny. Secret of Monkey Island took nine months to make. Secret of Monkey Island 2 took a year. Day of the Tentacle took a year and then a half to do the voice stuff. Full Throttle took a whole year, which we thought was pretty grueling. And then Grim Fandango took three years. When the game finally ships in 1998, the effort put into it shows. I played Grim Fandango. My kids actually really loved it, too. They called it the Skeleton Game. 
it was one of those games of like, wh where does he come up with this stuff? And it was so well written and so well, you know, acted. Ah, pumped another one. Lousy, bony fingers. There was a really obvious, um, passionate uh, dedication to quality. The musicians, just amazing the soundtrack, all different music type, all these live instruments, and a whole new step of animation that we'd never tried before. I like to think that people just responded to someone caring that much about a game. I was a huge Grim Fandango fan. That's definitely on my top 10 list of all time. We won Game of the Year on GameSpot, and it got really good reviews, and it really stood out for people as a unique title. And it sold pretty well. In some ways, it was right at the end of adventure games, and it came out. People thought it was really good, and they thought it didn't sell very well, so that became this kind of like, well, if it, it was that good, it didn't sell well, then adventure games must be dead. Yeah, well, you don't have a tongue, but that doesn't seem to shut you up now, does it? It made its financial plan, and I got a royalty check from it, so it made money, so it's kind of too bad that people uh, remember it that way. Despite Grim Fandango's success, adventure games continue to wane in popularity. Ah, cheer up, buddy. Another day, another death. Am I right? Meanwhile, Tim Schafer will soon make a career-changing decision that will take him on the roller coaster ride of a lifetime. There's just one day left to make sure that Psychonauts is ready to ship. The journey's been hard, and it shows. No, someone keeps on plugging it. Tim Schaefer. Sure, it's Tim Schaefer. Ugh. The team all looks like they kill me all the time. It's early. I keep trying to watch TV and he keeps connecting the Xbox. The bastard. I know. You're fixing all the bugs and fixing any last minute touch up stuff. It's been hard. My boyfriend proposed to me on a build on a build night, and then he had to bring me back to work. If you just sit here and stare at the desk for a long time. You can really get, you get migraines and your eyes start to kind of fade. <laughs> you know, it's just really unhealthy sitting in one place. This is one of the worst crunches I've ever seen. Definitely sort of appalling in how intense it is. But the people, you know, they seem to keep their spirits up, joking about it at four in the morning. It's time to make the, the beer and ice cream run. At the turn of the century, Tim Schaefer makes a drastic change. After Grimm, I, I, I kind of went home for a couple months. Then I came back into work at LucasArts, kind of groggy, and then it started to feel at that point like it would be a good time to maybe try it on our own. So some of the team kind of talked about it. And we wanted to be in control of our own destinies, and then one day we just left. When he left LucasArts, it was definitely like, whoa, what's going on? You know, everybody wants to start their own company eventually. So we did. After more than eight years at LucasArts, Schaefer finally leaves for greener pastures. It was just kind of a leap of faith. We just quit our jobs and we're like, let's make some phone calls and see what happens. Eventually, Schaefer finds office space and a name for his new company. Double Fine comes from a sign on the Golden Gate Bridge that says a uh, slow to 45 double fine zone. When I was a kid, coming from the country, driving into the city, I'd see that sign on the Golden Gate Bridge and think it would be great to have a band called Double Fine because people would think that that was about us. So I took that idea and we started the company. Double Fine's first game will come from an idea that Schaefer has had for years. <laughs> I'd wanted to do for a long time a game that involved people's inner workings in their mind. And I was actually pitching that to somebody like, OK, you're going to go into your own head. And, and they actually misheard me, and they're like, so wait, you're going into other people's heads. I was like, other people's heads? That's a great idea. So we started Psychonauts. Every game needs a memorable hero. Everybody calls me Raz. Please don't kill us! Raz, the main character, cannot just read mine. What are you going to just shut up and kiss me? Shut up and do what? Oh, I didn't know you could. Uh, I gotta go. My soul is... But he can actually jump into people's heads, you know, and he can go into this imaginary world that's comprised of just that person's hopes and dreams. So, this is it. The mental world. 
but they're made real. The level design is that person's personality. And you fight their mental demons, and you see their emotional baggage there. Whatever you're going through, you're not alone. Kid, can't you see I'm trying to have a moment here? <laughs> definitely like an adventure platformer. It's very surreal because you're going into people's heads. It's got an Alice in Wonderland, very surreal dreamlike quality to it. It's kind of Toontown on crack. We really want it to be kind of stylized and cartoony and stuff. Get really cool moods and colors and stuff like that. Here's some environments that Peter Chan did. This is the Milkman conspiracy level. It's like the guy is like Conspiracy theorist, you know, he's totally just crazed out. Organized labor with the backing of the cows. It's supposed to give you a feeling of paranoia. The cows, they want all of us. It's really chill. You're supposed to feel like you're being watched all the time and just get totally just freaked out. I am the milkman. My milk is delicious. Special delivery today. Psychonauts, I mean, it's just amazing. And on one hand, exactly what you'd expect from Tim Schafer and, and his kind of crew, and on the other hand, it's like something completely different that you've never seen before. From this day forward. And then came to the Game Developers Conference in 2000. Bill Gates gave his big speech, and we're like, mm, how do we get involved in that? That sounds pretty cool. And afterwards, Ed Freeze came up and wanted to talk about how Psychonauts was perfect for the Xbox. Tim Schafer and Ed Freeze work out a publishing deal with Microsoft that will make Psychonauts an Xbox exclusive game. But not everything works out the way they plan. On March 30th, 2004, Microsoft kills the deal. I believe it had a lot to do with Ed Freeze departing. We weren't the only game that was reconsidered at the time of Ed's departure. And Ed was a, a huge advocate for the product and, and believed in art and creativity. And games as a creative medium. When he told the team, and that, and that, that was, and that's the hardest thing. You, you know, standing up and telling the team that that happened was kind of. It was it was hard because the team was doing a really really good job, and they were all working really really hard. And they were making an amazing game. So to come and tell that the reward for making that excellent game was that it was canceled. Well, it felt like a bombshell. And they're like, oh boy, we need some, we need some, um, some money. Everybody just said, okay, we're canceled. Now what are we gonna do? This is your last chance to chicken out. Oh, me, sir. I'd like to chicken out, please. Funny thing was, though, the day after it happened, everybody was back to work. Come on, let's go. Trying to get it finished, even though we didn't know what was gonna happen. We all believe in it that much that we want to see it through to the end. We managed to keep everyone paid the entire time and pay the rent the whole time. My whole life savings is in the company now, and we took out some loans, and we did what we had to do to just keep them going. There was a bigger element of we have something big and huge and amazing here. Oh, so we set about finding, you know, another partner. We just kept working on it. We didn't have a publisher. It didn't matter. We all kept working on it and, you know, stuck to our schedules. Because we knew in the end, I think we would persevere. Because we knew this game had to get made. The team's belief in Psychonauts pays off. We pitched to everybody, and then we didn't know who Majesco was. I mean, I had, didn't know a lot about them. I'd heard the name. They were first talking about just maybe doing a, a small port of the game. Maybe you'd like to do a you know, handheld version or something like that. And we talked to them more and more, and we liked them. They saw more of the game, and they got more excited. And then they were like, we want the whole game. We like it. Let's go. Here's the money. Let's go. <laughs> With a new publisher and a new budget, Double Fine is reinvigorated. Psychonauts heads into the home stretch. This is our last uh, all nighter build. Wow. How close are you being done? Um. It's the last day of development on Psychonauts. Almost. Yeah. We are almost there. Come hell or high water, the game must be ready to go. Uh, well, we have to be zero bugs. Everything must be perfect. From the audio... No, 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 no. Just a couple of tricky ones about audio. Like, we don't, we can't have the music stutter. Are you hearing that? Yeah, that's kind of weird. The worst one is probably this voice one where every once in a while a line will play kind of backwards or out of order. That is worse. That's the, I'm t those stuttering things are worse. One out of ten times, he'll say it like Yoda. He'll say, I'd like you to meet Mr. Pokelope. And he says, Mr. Pokelope, I'd like you to meet. 
and it's this really weird bug that we don't know what is causing it. Dialogue is very important to me, so I, I want to get that one right. That's right, baby. To the graphics. Right now, I'm looking here at some, uh, doing some reductions to optimize the game for the Xbox, keep it a uh, consistent frame rate at 30 frames per second. So far, we did everything we could to keep the best looking game we could when it gets ready to ship. To the scripting and animations. I've listened to all of the individual voice, voice files like four times each. There are over 8,000 of them. First, I would read what Tim wrote and be like, oh, that's pretty funny. But then the way that a character would sort of vocalize it would make it even funnier and then like seeing it all come together, it's great. Hey, that's how we set the right mood for the play. Mess with that and we'll have happy plays on sad sets, sad plays on happy sets, total chaos, or worse, improv. And the whole thing comes alive and it, you know, paired up with some crazy animation. <laughs> There's still things that make me laugh. I'm gonna kill you so much. And most importantly, the gameplay. There is so much about Psychonauts. It's long and grueling <laughs> and a little scary. Psychonauts is a very, very different game. After four years of hard development, Double Fine Productions finally wraps up Psychonauts on February 26, 2005. But uh, I, I'm not going to make a huge speech because my hair is really puffy and I'm on TV. <laughs> It's been like a roller coaster. It's been really great to see it turn into something that we really consider fun. Like all of a sudden it becomes real and you can play through the game and things that were abstract before turn into a, a satisfying experience. For Tim Schaefer, Psychonauts is more than just another game. It represents everything he and the team at Double Fine have worked for up to now and is the start of a new age for a true game god. Until you actually make your first game, you know, you're not really a game company, you know, you're just kind of an embodiment of a, a contract that was signed, you know, you're working off of that, and then you make a game, and now it's published, so it's just a huge thing for us. Let's not feel like this thing that started five years ago, we found a company is really finally real. I love working for Tim. He's great. He's awesome. There are times that it can be frustrating to work with him, but in the end, I know why he's asking for what he's asking. I want this game to be done right, so I'm, I'm gonna do whatever I can to support that vision. It's his name that's on the box, not mine, but I want it to be good too. Tim is, you know, demanding. He won't let something go in the game if it's just kind of half-assed. <laughs> Creativity is key, and it just flows through everybody here. Helping create, you know, a game like this is just a fantastic experience. Do you ever wish that you had a job at a normal? Um, no way. It's like been a huge part of my life. It's made me believe in the game industry again. So after playing Psychonauts, the originality of not knowing what to expect next, it really made an impact. I'm super excited. I loved working on the game. I have no regrets. I'm glad I made the decision to join Double Fine and work on Psychonauts. I think the world will be ready to see it. There's some incredibly talented people here. It's a really good group of people. Probably one of the best places I've ever worked at. And I feel privileged to be here working amongst all of these people. And it makes it such a joy to work with. I think that illuminates through the game as well. We love the game. You know, we all put a lot into it, and we like the way it came out. When are you going to shut up and kiss me? I'm really excited about the game coming out. Oh, I 
hope we get something better than pizza. We have pizza all the time here. It's, I hope we have a really good party. Crunch mode is in the very, very last phases of the game, and it's basically you just want to put as many hours into the game and to test it. We've done everything creatively we're going to do to the game. Those are good. Yeah, that's too, too low. low, too low. Oh yeah. my god, that's terrible. Man, you can't ship with that. They would return low. the game if they saw that. And now we just have to play it for a certain amount of time and make sure no new bugs come up. So it can't crash, it can't slow down, nothing really bad can happen. Lies. We can't write any more dialogue or add any more ideas to it, but we can definitely make sure it's not gonna crash right away. We are going to be testing at least probably 12 hours a day, trying to find any last showstoppers, any bugs that we can't ship. And you can't punch at all? The goal is to have everyone playing through the game. There's a team of over 40 people, all of us, and all of Majesco's resources are getting through the entire game, so making sure the game is, is ready to go out. What happens if it's not done by Friday? Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> We're screwed. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong? No. I can't punch. Tim Shaper's first taste of gaming happens when the Magnavox Odyssey is released in 1972. Way back when I was a kid, my dad brought home uh, Odyssey 1, which was uh, the black and white variations of Pong. He quickly becomes one of the world's first. And my office, here's my office here. Here we are. Come on in, won't you? From the offices of a new game studio. And this is our test department. Very exciting. Hello, testers. You know, everybody wants to start their own company eventually. An industry legend. Uh, this is the exciting manner in which I work, I guess. Tim certainly does not follow the herd. He goes his own way for good or ill. And that's something that I admire. And his team of talented game developers. I'm an environment artist. I'm the animation supervisor. I'm an animator. And I'm the lead game tester. I am the orderly. And I run a quiet, peaceful, insane asylum. We'll race the clock to ship their very first game. We put to Bruce here because we were always battling against time. We've been working on the game for three and a half years. This is one of the worst crunches I've ever seen. Sort of appalling. We decided at the very last minute to actually test it. <laughs> this is the story of Tim Schaefer and the final week of Psychonauts. What could possibly go wrong? Hardcore gamers. Ever since then, I was, I was hooked on games. And then we got our Atari 2600. Yeah, and went from there to Atari computers. And I got a 400 and an 800. And then I spent all my teenage years at home toiling over that computer in the uh, rec room of our house, scaring my whole family. And like many gamers of his time, Tim Schaefer begins creating his own games. I started as best I could to actually make them myself when I had the computer, although my efforts were really unspectacular. In basic, I tried to do a Pong in basic, and it was really slow. So I tried to do Galaxian in assembly language, and I just realized I, I wasn't really smart enough to do that. So I had this one game about a, a helicopter that was dropping babies, and you had to catch them. I got pretty far with that one. But when he attends college at UC Berkeley, Schaefer tries to be more realistic about his future. I never really thought that games were what I was going to end up doing. So as I went to college, I, I did more computer classes and I started to drift into writing. I was going to be a writer who had a really boring computer programming database job during the day. And then write at night. He really is a really smart guy, a really funny guy, satirical. Off the top of my head, the first funny game I remember was Leisure Suit Larry or Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I guess Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy came out first. You can really tell that he has an opinion on everything. I'm trying to think if there's anything else funny in games ever. And he's not afraid to, to tell you about it. I think it was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now oh, welcome. Come on in. Come on in. 
Welcome to Double Fine. Please, everyone is welcome at Double Fine. We've been here about uh, a year and a half. We moved over one block nicer, one block fancier. Here's our production area. Hello, everybody. Say hi. That's Kelly and Melina. That's Carolyn, my executive producer. Hey, hello. I'm executive producer. I'm kind of the acting production person. I do just about everything um, the company needs to allow Tim to be 100% creative as much as possible. Here's our art department. It's Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello. Playing the game, excellent game, Psychonauts, right now. Scott Campbell, our art director. This is a camera. I draw stuff and show Tim, and it's like a long process of like him liking it or not liking it or kind of liking it. What are you making there? So who's that character? Okay, so anyway. Here's our gameplay programming department. Hello, gameplay programmers. So, hello. This week, Tim Schaefer and his team of game developers are putting finishing touches on their first game, Psychonauts. We've been working on the game for three and a half years. A lot of the animation's been done for quite a while. This is our last week of working on Psychonauts. I think this week is the, this Friday night is the last the last build. We just have to have it done CD. So this is the final build. So this week is the last bit of time we have to touch it. Game developers call this. I can't be right. Sometimes in a, in a world where everybody seems to kind of be. A, Afraid to say what they think or do what they think or follow the herd. Help me out. Anything funny before Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Tim certainly does not follow the herd. He goes his own way. Yeah, I would, yeah, I would say the first humor in games I remember was Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And that, that's something that I admire. But it turns out that fate has a different plan for Tim Schaefer. I graduated and I was on my second interview with this database company. And right then I saw this job listing at LucasArts, which was then called Lucasfilm Games. It was even more kind of glamorous and appealing. And I loved the first Lucasfilm games, like Rescue and Fractalus and Ball Blazer. But a friend of mine had slipped me a pirated copy of it, so I called it Ball Blaster during my interview. I was like, yeah, I really like your game Ball Blaster. And they're like, Ball Blaster, huh? That's, that's what it was called when it was pirated. So was, I'm, I don't know how I got that job, but somehow I got that job. Now, with his foot in the door, Schaefer will take his first step into gaming history. <laughs>